Well, do please take your seats, everyone. And uh, if you're here for the first time, we're working through Luke's Gospel. In fact, our series comes to an end next week with Palm Sunday. But if you'd like to turn to page 1053, we've got to Luke chapter 19. Page 1053. We're going to read verses 1 through to 27, a bit of a chunk for us today. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them the parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. And then he sent for the servant to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, Take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you do not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Or why then didn't you put my money on deposit, so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? And then he said to those standing by, take his miner away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. (coughs) So they said, he already has ten. He replied, I'll tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, Even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. And so says God's word. Well, I remember a few years ago reading a a story about a classic holiday fail. Uh, Someone who got very excited to see trip to Sydney at a third of the price it usually would be, so he booked himself in with real eagerness. He only started realising something was wrong when he looked down and he saw snow-covered mountains below him rather than the turquoise sea that you would see as you were on your way to Australia. He booked himself in to Sydney, Canada. It's a town of just 6,000 people and the temperature can get as low as minus 10. Apparently when he turned up at the hotel they said, you're not the first. We had someone else who made the same mistake. I guess one of the all-important questions for the Christian is this. How can I know that I'm really on the right plane, that I'm going to the right destination to the kingdom of God? How do I know that I'm really a Christian? How do I know I'm saved, that my faith is real? We all think that at times. 
But if you do do that, don't despair, because today's passage gets to the heart of that. Firstly, it gives us real encouragement that the plane of Christ takes all types of passengers. That's the point with Zacchaeus, isn't it? Have a look at verse 2. There were two reasons you would think he would be disqualified from the kingdom of God. Number one, he's one of the corrupt tax collectors. And actually, if you look, we're told he's a chief corrupt tax collector. And number two, he's wealthy as well. So as a tax collector, you'd think his immorality would mean he couldn't get to the kingdom of God. And as a wealthy person, you'd expect his inability wouldn't get him there. Do you remember Jesus' words from just a chapter ago? In chapter 18, verse 25, when we had the rich young ruler, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, here we've got one. Surely he then can't get to this kingdom. The wealthy get so caught up in their money that they can't even think about Jesus. And those who do, as soon as they realise Jesus wants them to give of what they've got, well, that's when they pull back, as we saw in chapter 18. But do you remember Jesus' words that followed? He said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So we're about to see a miracle, an utter miracle, in that a wealthy tax collector is able to board this, board this plane. Just have a look at what happens. First, think about his desire to see Jesus. So we saw previously, didn't we, that the problem with the man in the previous chapter was blindness, so he couldn't see. So Jesus' problem is smallness, so he can't. But where's the blind man said, help you see? So Jesus climbs up the tree that perhaps the Lord had planted just for that moment. And then he can see Jesus. And his determination should challenge us, shouldn't it? To so long to see Jesus that we will climb the tree to see him. Yes, that's why you're here. You're climbing a tree. You come to see Jesus. That's why we go to our groups. That's why we open our Bibles. To see Jesus. But we want to climb, not reluctantly, but longingly. Zacchaeus... You have a sense, his, his neck's craning to see over the crowd. I want to see him. What a great example that is, isn't it? For the mindset with which we come to hear God's word. I want to see Jesus. No doubt he could be doing many other things, including collecting his taxes. But also consider Christ's desire to be with him. Verse 5. Jesus reaches the spot and looks up. Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. Can you imagine just how he must have felt? You know, Jesus, are you, are you talking to me? I, you, you do know that I'm the chief tax collector. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house. In the Christian to Explore course this week, we were talking about Lou Wallace, who was an atheist who'd been challenged to uh, write a book disproving Christianity. So he did lots and lots of research, and he became a Christian. It was so convincing. He talks of how he got down on his knees and cried out, my Lord and my God. And then he used his research to write one of the most famous books in the English language, Ben-Hur. If you've read the book, it's all about presenting Christ through the story. Sometimes we, we, we might want to see Jesus for all sorts of reasons. There might even be wrong ones. But he might surprise us, as he does with Zacchaeus, and say, hang on, I'm coming to your house, as he did with Lou Wallace. Well, I wonder what your experience has been. The people matter, don't they, that Jesus has gone as a guest of a sinner, verse 7, they don't realise that's exactly the point. But what reassurance for us that even a wealthy tax collector can board the plane of Christ, can be on his way to the kingdom of God. Isn't that encouraging? You know, there's no sin that we've committed ever that is beyond, I mean, the grace and the truth of Christ, nothing. He's sufficient for it all. There's no distance too far that he can't cross it. 
No, he comes to us, he says, look, I, I'm coming to your house. Well, Zacchaeus responds now. Uh, and consider Christ's words then from verse 9. His conclusion, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is saying, look, everyone, look on, this wealthy, corrupt tax collector, he's now in. Can you, can you see the good works Zacchaeus does? No, because they're not there. He says, I'm going to do something. He doesn't do any of it. But he's in. Why? Well, because he believes. Because he entrusts himself to Christ. And it's all Jesus' initiative, isn't it? Because, verse 10, this is why he's come. If you feel lost, the word there has the idea of something ruined. Lost as in decomposing in the ground somewhere, that kind of lost. If you feel like that, Jesus says, I've come to seek out and save you. People like you. Put you back together. But it brings us back to our first question that we're going to spend the rest of our time on. You know, how can I know that Christ has found me, that I'm his? How can I know if I'm really a Christian, if I'm really, really saved? Well, in Zacchaeus, we see two great signs of that, two great proofs of it. First, that he receives Christ with joy, and second, that he serves Christ with generosity. Those are the two things to weigh up. He receives Christ with joy and he serves Christ with generosity. Let's think about the first one. He receives Christ with joy. Verse 6. He came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. It's often said of Christianity that it's about a relationship rather than a religion. Now, obviously, it's a religion in the sense that we believe in God and things like that. But it is about a relationship, isn't it? So he has welcomes Jesus into his home. They're now interacting. They're spending time together. He's not holding him at a distance. He's welcoming him. There are what we call nominal Christians. That means Christians in name only. Those who simply go to church and go through the motion. And then there are those who've received Christ with joy. That's the true Christian, isn't it? Eagerly welcoming him into our hearts and into our homes. Just picture, if you can, the unwilling host. Kids, I know that you might be able to engage with this. You don't always want someone to come round, do you? Particularly if you're into that. So you hear the knock on the door. And you don't open the door fully, you just open it partially, you might maybe with a latch on there. Sorry, I, I just, I'm, I'm a bit busy, I've got lots on at the moment. And as they turn away, you close the door. It's quite close. Or maybe mum or dad say, no, 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 they've got to come in. Oh, come on. And as they sit down, I, I need to go to the loo. You take your phone, you sit in the toilet, 45 minutes an hour, you're just hoping they might go because you don't really want them there. I'm sure that's just the kids that do that. <laughs> but that's not receiving people gladly, is it? What's the equivalent of that when it comes to Jesus? Ah, oh, just a little bit. I'll have a little glimpse of you, but I really don't want time with you. There can be those even in the church like that. But the true Christian receives Jesus gladly. You know? Thankful, amazed that he would come to their door. It's wide open. You've almost pulled the thing off its hinges. You know, come in. Please. Let me show you around. Come and have a look. Here's my kids. Meet my family. Please don't go. Just stay. I'll, I'll get some food on for you. Here's a bed. Just stay. Here, please. Jesus. You'd stumble over yourself, wouldn't you? Receiving Christ is a matter of the heart. And so please be reassured, if you're someone who's received Jesus with joy, you know in your heart of hearts that you want him, you delight to have him. You call on him forgiveness, for forgiveness. You 
You desire to spend time with him. Well, be encouraged like Zacchaeus. Salvation has come to your house. But there's a second mark here as well that goes with it. And that is one of serving him then uh, with generosity. There's a strange thing, uh, kids, about parents when their parents come round to the house. So um, my in-laws, I, I always know when they're present in the house, even if I've not seen it yet. Because uh, the kitchen will be cleaned up. Things might not be in the best place, but they're, they're cleaned up. They, they arrive and their presence is immediately seen by doing stuff around the house, putting everything in order. Which I think is quite a good thing, really, but I'm not sure whether Bethany agrees. But yeah. Their presence makes a difference. That's what it is to welcome Christ gladly. You know, when we welcome him into our hearts and into our homes, he comes and he starts putting things in order. You know? He starts changing our hearts. And as he changes our hearts, he starts to change our homes and our lives and every sphere that we engage in. And, and, and the thing is, that's a sign that Jesus is present in us and with us. A sign, therefore, of our salvation. It's what we call regeneration. Christ comes to us by his Holy Spirit and he turns our hearts of stone into our heart of flesh. He, he works at that inner place that the Bible calls the heart, which is the place of desire and decision. And he, he, he renews it. So where previously what we desire, desired was to please ourselves, and to serve ourselves, and every decision followed that. Now, because he's renewed and recreated it, now our desire is to please God and serve God. And so every decision now is for him, do you see? Regeneration, a regenesis, a recreation in our inner being. That's why everything changes. Just have a look at verse 8. We read Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times that amount. It's an immediate change, isn't it? Something's happened deep inside him. The rudder has been reset. And note that Zacchaeus doesn't say, that I will give. Can you see in verse 8? What does he say? I now give immediate, wholehearted. And uh, what's the nature of this? Well, first of all, he delights in Scripture. So it's Exodus 22 that says, if you steal a sheep, you must pay back four times the amount. And so immediately he's starting to think, okay, well, how do I obey the Bible? Because I'm now for this Christ, this Messiah. So Scripture becomes the centre for him as it does for us as Christians. We want to please Jesus, and so we listen to what he says in the Bible, we want to put it into practice. But it's not that he simply delights now in Scripture, but he delights now in service. His whole attitude to wealth has been changed. He's been storing and storing and storing for himself, and now he wants to give and give and give for others. Now, and note his motive. There's no sense here of fear of punishment. There's no sense, I want to be in the kingdom of Jesus, so if I do this, can I then be in? No, what's driving his generosity is love. Sheer delight in Christ. Look at verse 8. Just place yourself in those words. Look, Lord, look, here and now I'm going to give this away. Okay? Half my possessions to the poor, four times as much for anyone I've cheated. I couldn't help thinking of the, the swat at school. Look, sir, look, I, I've made a plan for my revision and these are my assignments I want to do. Come and see. There's such a delight in the pleasure of the one you're serving that you, you, just, you just want them to know, this is what I'm, I'm now going to do for you. Grace shows the greatest pleasure that Christian experiences is to know they're pleasing Christ. The greatest joy we can ever know is to know his joy at what we do. Something radical has changed in Zacchaeus. And this is what made the difference. Jesus had not only entered his home, 
You'd entered his heart. The Apostle Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20. He says as a Christian, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then he says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The, the Christian is someone who Christ comes to live within him and then it's all about Jesus. So much so that we can say, well, I no longer live anymore. It's just about him. That's the Zacchaeus. Think if you can about a sheep. It wanders off without a shepherd guarding it and it falls off a, a ravine and um, breaks a leg. It can't get back, it's, it's going to die unless something's done. But the sheep is looked after by a good shepherd, so the good shepherd puts the rest of his sheep in a pen where they're going to be nice and safe, and he goes out to find that sheep. And he spends all day looking for it, you know the parable that Jesus says. And then he finds that sheep, and he puts it on his shoulders with real joy, and he takes it back to join the others. But, of course, the sheep's injured. And so he nurses the sheep tenderly, he fixes a splint to the leg and makes sure that sheep is uh, going to eat well and exercise well and the sheep then gets back on its feet and then what does it do? Well now it's got the most precious relationship with the shepherd. That sheep's never going to wander again, it's just going to trot along behind him and it'll follow him. Christian, that's what happens when we come to Christ, isn't it? He comes and seeks us out to save us. He binds up the broken hearted. He mends us through the forgiveness of our sin and the gift of the Spirit. And then, why would we go anywhere else? You know, now we're going to stick with him. We're going to trot along behind our shepherd. We're never going to leave him because of what he's done for us. Now, it's not just religion. It's relationship. We know him and he knows us. Well, from verse 11 onwards, Jesus now tells a parable. If you look at verse 11, while they were listening to this, he gives the parable. So we're supposed to see this as an illustration that supports what's just been said. We haven't got enough time to go in depth, but let's, let's cover it fairly briefly. Verse 12, the nobleman going to a foreign country, that's Christ ascending up into heaven to receive a kingdom, the kingdom. And he's going to come back. Now, if you look at verse 14, there are some subjects who don't want him as king, that's unbelievers in Jesus' day and ever since. He is king, whether we like it or not, but many do not want him. But you haven't just got subjects here, you've also got servants. So from verse 13, he calls together ten servants, he gives them ten miners each, that's about £10,000 in modern money, to use well while he's off getting the kingdom, and then he's going to come back. I hope you can see the point in context. This comes right after Zacchaeus, who's saying, well, look, what are the miners that I've got? Well, I've got all this money that I've accumulated. I'm going to give half of it off to the poor. So he's going to use his money well for King Jesus. That's the point here. It's primarily a financial one. But there are principles that go beyond that as well. It's pictured so vividly in the book of Revelation do you remember how the elders, who I think they represent believers, they lay their crowns down. They're going to reign with Christ, but they lay their crowns down at Christ's feet. Now, all that they've been given is for serving him, as we sung in our first hymn, as tribute. And it's in that context that we hear the angels singing these words, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Now just look at those words. Think about what those angels are saying. They're saying, Christians, believers, whatever influence you have in life, that's the power. Whatever riches, that's the wealth. Whatever education, whatever energy that you've got, whatever respect or fame or acknowledgement, Christ is worthy of you get, taking all that stuff and laying it down at his feet using it in his service. Those are the miners that Christ has entrusted to you, and he wants them to be used well while he's away, you see? The point is that we've been saved to serve. 
That's our great calling in life as we wait for Christ's return, to use this short time on earth to serve well our King. This is what life is to be about. Now, to my mind, I think there are two great hindrances to this in our day. The first is over-busyness. Many of us feel this, the cost of living's risen, so we've taken on more work. There's lots that's going on, hobbies and everything as well. And it can mean that we don't sufficiently give time to the main thing, which is to serve King Jesus. Now, for some of us, there's very little we can change because of financial needs or whatever, but it's good to ask, is there something I can change? Can I somehow reduce my hours, downsize, buy less, in order to give more in serving of Christ? Or, or picking up the financial point, is it actually that I, I just actually need to be giving more of the money that I'm earning well to do good with it? But over business is a problem. The other problem that can keep us from serving well is overprotectiveness. Many have noted that with younger adults today, they've grown up with a much greater sense of work-life balance. Now, that's not all wrong. But our work-life balance is going to be different from the world, isn't it? Because those who don't know Christ, they're living for this life. So they want to keep working check so they can suck as much out of whatever many years they have. But not us. Now we're living for the life to come. Now is the time for serving. So yes, we need to think about that, but we also need to think, am I being overprotective of my time? Could I actually do more, even though it's going to mean that I'm tired or that I'm tested? So that's what it is to serve the king. Well, to encourage us in that, take a look from verse 15. He was made king and returned home, and then he sent for the servants to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, good and faithful servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. That's the encouragement for us to serve well, isn't it? Two joyous things we receive from Jesus if we do. First is his praise. What great words to hear on the last day. I don't know what it's going to mean the moment after we die, but how glorious if the first thing we hear is, well done, good servant. Welcome into the kingdom. This is what you were living for. You're here. Well done. I really want to hear those words more than anything in the world. It seems the reward somehow fits the degree of faithfulness. Those who've got ten more get ten cities. Those who've got five more get five, but it's commendation and joy for both. I think it probably picks up the fact that Christ dispenses his gifts and his abilities differently between people too. I don't know what's going on with the cities. It's not impossible that that might be quite literal. We're looking forward to a kingdom on this earth, after all. But I, I think the principle is that those who display responsibility well now for Christ will receive responsibility on that day that honours them for that. And that should encourage us with all the other rewards of just being with Christ and each other when we get there. But for those who don't serve well, well, of course, they are like that servant from uh, verse 20 who hides the money in a cloth, who does nothing with it. We don't have time to look at the detail there, but the sense is, by saying he did that because he thought the king was a hard man, is he doesn't really know this king. And if he really thought the king was a hard man, he could have put it on for interest. So what's really behind him putting in the cloth is laziness, disinterest. But remember the servants, well they are, they're not the subjects who don't want Jesus to be king. The servants are those within the church, they're disciples here. Remember Psalm 11, 4, from his throne the Lord examines the children of men. Or 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment begins with the house of God. What we're learning here is there are three categories of people. There are unbelievers, the subjects who don't want the king at all. There are true believers, they're the servants who serve well. Imperfectly, come on, let's be honest, but serve well. And then there are false believers, 
who talk up being servants, but actually they have shown no signs of wanting to serve at all. There is a day that God has set when every one of us is going to stand raised from the dead before the judgment throne of Christ. The book of Revelation tells us that uh, a number of books are going to be opened. Whether that's literal or not, it's, it's to make a point. Those books, well, one is a book of life that records those chosen for salvation, those on the plane. The others are books of deeds which record everything that everyone has ever done in thought and word and deed and motive. And here's the thing, there's going to be a correspondence between those books. Those whose entry in the book of deeds shows little concern with serving Christ. They will find that their name was never actually written in the book of life. They were never a lover of Christ. They were never a Christian at all. But those whose names are in the book of life, they will have an entry in the book of deeds that lists their desire to serve Jesus. Lists their, their concern to do that, even when actually they can do very little. Lists that the longing. Lists the waking up. Lists the getting up out of the TV. Lists that phone call and that meal that's cooked. And that encouraging word. And that bold uh, reaching out. It will list deeds that prove that their faith in Christ was always genuine. That their reward with those words, welcome, good and faithful servant, is well justified. And in the words of Christ to Zacchaeus, that salvation had come into their home. Christ wants us to learn from Zacchaeus the signs of salvation are that we welcome him with joy and we serve him with generosity. Well, let's have a moment, shall we? To respond in prayer, a chance for you to say your own prayer. It might be, Lord, forgive me. He's always full of grace and truth. It might be, Lord, thank you uh, for your works in my life. It might be, Lord, help me now to live as someone who knows they've been saved to serve. A moment for your own prayers. And musicians, do you want to come up so we can sing straight off the back of this? Father in heaven, we thank you for these encouragements to us when we serve, that one day every, every act of service will gain the acknowledgement of Christ. But Father, we do sometimes feel very tired. And Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you sympathise with us in that. We pray, Lord, you forgive us the many ways we've failed to be perfect servants. But we pray too, Lord, that you would work your energy powerfully within us. Help us particularly to see how we might order our lives according to this great calling that we have uh, in being servants uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask it for his sake. Amen. Oh,